The German aircraft designer, Kurt Tank, is justifiably famous for creating some of the most famous aircraft in history. But I think it is fair to say that he is primarily remembered for one aircraft in particular, the Indian Hal Marut. Ha, only kidding. It is, of course, actually the Focke-Wulf 190 series and its offshoots, which from that type's first encounter with Allied aircraft in 1941 was recognised as an extremely dangerous opponent. But obviously, Tank didn't just produce such an excellent fighter out of thin air. Like most of the great designers, his career was part of the continuous drive to improve aircraft and implement new technologies that marked this period. But where many designers had far more modest beginnings to their careers, Tank started his aircraft designing career at the cutting edge of aero technology of the day. And his first fighter shows this handsomely, the Rohrbach R09, also known as the Rofix, a fighter built for Turkey, designed in Germany, and built in Denmark. So, how does one get to such a complicated arrangement? With Germany's defeat in the First World War, the victorious Allies stipulated in the Treaty of Versailles, specifically Article 170, that Germany was forbidden from exporting weapons. But interestingly, it doesn't say anything about designing them. So it was that in 1922, the Rohrbach Metallflugzeugbau Company was set up by Adolf Rohrbach expressly to work on developing all-metal aircraft. This technology had been developed to some extent, with aircraft like the Junkers J1 and all-metal aircraft in fact flying in 1915. But there was still a long way to go before the all-metal aircraft would be able to replace the existing fabric and wooden airframes that were the norm of the day. And it was visionaries like Rohrbach who would help drive this development, assisted by his new and talented designer, who had only graduated from the Technical University of Berlin in 1923, Kurt Tank. At Rohrbach, Tank cut his teeth working in this developing aircraft construction technique, and Rohrbach's all-metal flying boat designs received a huge amount of interest, with two even being built under licence by the British. Of course, there was the irritating detail of aircraft manufacture being banned in Germany, hence the establishment of a Rohrbach aircraft factory in Denmark. And so it was, with their flying boats getting so much attention, it was practically inevitable that someone would ask the company if they could turn their energies to more aggressive aircraft. Thus, it was in December 1925 that the Turkish government approached Rohrbach with a request that they develop for them a new fighter. The order requested two prototypes, with the intention being that a follow-up order for 50 would be placed should testing prove satisfactory. Tank got to work and developed the R09. Design and construction was actually extremely quick, with the first prototype being ready for flight testing in late 1926. One of the reasons for the rapid development was that Rohrbach had been contracted to develop a fighter for the Japanese Navy in 1924, which ultimately seems to have fizzled out. But the company was able to utilise that preliminary work to create an advanced fighter in an extremely fast time. The R09 had a single parasol wing that was dihedral and semi-cantilevered, with the use of steel wing structures and supports enabling the removal of much of the wing struts that were pretty much standard features in aircraft of the day. The fuselage was also of all-metal construction, with a thin alloy stressed skin that used flush riveting for excellent streamlining. Power plant was a BMW 6 water-cooled V12 that produced 600 horsepower on takeoff, and proposed armament would have been two machine guns in the fuselage, with provision for an additional two in the wings. It is perhaps instructive to look at another contemporary fighter to give an indication of just how advanced the R09 was. The same year that the Rohrbach flew, the Royal Air Force was ordering the Gloucester Gamecock for service, which I have done a video on and will link to at the end. This aircraft was built entirely of wood, was armed with two machine guns, and was of a biplane design with a multitude of wires and supports that such a design entailed. Don't get me wrong, the Gamecock was a perfectly competent fighter for its day, and certainly equivalent to other countries' fighter aircraft. But the R09 was really pointing to the future, the era of the all-metal monoplane, and this in the mid-1920s. You can also see the differences in their respective performances. 
Whilst the Gamecock had a top speed of 155 miles per hour, the R09 clocked in at 177 miles per hour. It also had a higher service ceiling. Of course, aircraft design is generally a series of compromises, and the R09's was its spinning characteristics. Testing did in fact show that the R09 had very good flight and landing characteristics, but in the spin it could be vicious. The first major problems with the flight program occurred on the 27th of January 1927, when one of the test pilots crashed the first prototype. He was unhurt, but the aircraft was written off. The spin issue led to the second aircraft's wing being tweaked several times to try to mitigate the problem, and by July of 1927 it was thought to have been largely solved. The aircraft had been flown nearly 50 times, not just by the company's test pilots, but also by several of Germany's famous World War I aces, notably Ernst Udet, who would go on to be a huge influence on the Luftwaffe when it was created in the 1930s. Transfer of the R09 to the Turkish Air Force was scheduled for the 20th of July, the aircraft having been even painted in Turkish colours. But then, disaster struck. On the 15th, only five days before the transfer, the R09 was sent up for a demonstration flight. The pilot was Paul Baumer, another famous fighter pilot who was ranked as Germany's ninth highest scoring ace from the First World War. Baumer was working as a freelance test pilot for Rohrbach and took the aircraft up to 5,000 metres to conduct a spin recovery test. He got the R09 back under controlled flight at 3,000 metres, as had been expected. He then put it into another spin, but something went wrong and the plane crashed into the waters of the Ullersund off of Copenhagen. Baumer apparently tried to bail out, but was too late and was killed. It is difficult to know what went wrong with the R09's final flight. Kurt Tank, who was watching the demonstration, stated that he believed that the engine speed had been too low for the second spin test to take place, and as a result, the fault was pilot error. That's possible, though as the designer of the aircraft, he could be accused of having a skewed and biased view of events. But what is certain is the result. With the second crash and loss, the Turks cancelled their interest in the aircraft. This was apparently followed up by Rohrbach himself destroying all company documentation on the R09 and refusing to allow his company to develop any more fighters. And that would be that. Except, of course, Kurt Tank was the designer, and he went on to other things, including developing this, the Focke-Wulf FW-159. This was designed in 1934 and built in 1935 to compete for the new German fighter contracts that sprang up in the wake of Hitler taking over power in Germany. While it lost out to the Messerschmitt Bf-109, the use of an all-metal, stress-skinned parasol design certainly harks back to the earlier R09, Kurt Tank's first fighter. Hope you enjoyed this video. If so, please share with others, drop a like, and maybe watch one of the videos being suggested now. Have a good one, and I'll catch you all next time.